listeners. Welcome to Grief Out Loud. Remember the last time you tried to talk about grief and suddenly everybody left the room? Grief Out Loud is opening up this often avoided conversation because grief is hard enough without having to go through it alone. We bring you a mix of personal stories, tips for supporting children, teens, and yourself, and interviews with professionals in the grief world. Platitude and cliche-free, we promise. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Jana DeCristofero, and produced by Dougie Center, the National Grief Center for Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. At the age of 27, Dr. Peg Sandine faced an impossible request. Her husband, John, who was dying from HIV AIDS, told Peg that he couldn't stand the pain anymore, and he wanted her to help him end his life. It was the early 1990s, and there was no legal avenue for Peg to help her husband with what he wanted, to die with the dignity he had in life. Before he died, John pushed Peg to finish applying to social work graduate programs, helping her with the essays she had to write and the boxes she had to tick as she was caring for both John and their young daughter, Hannah. Peg went on to get both a master's and PhD in social work, and the memory of John's last wish motivated her to work towards changing the landscape for people facing the end of life. Dr. Sandine is now the executive director of Death with Dignity, a national organization working in end-of-life advocacy and policy reform, fighting for medical aid and dying laws across the U.S. While this is a conversation about Dr. Sandine's work with Death with Dignity, as is true for most conversations about death, it's also a conversation about life about the life she shared with her husband, John, and what it was like to be a young couple surrounded by friends who were building their own lives, while Peg and John's life was so focused on illness and death. It's a conversation about the shame and stigma and lack of treatment options for HIV in the late 1980s and early 1990s. A conversation about living with the grief of John's death, and also a conversation about the ways Peg sought to support their daughter Hannah's grief before and after her father's death. Peg, welcome to Grief Out Loud. I am looking forward to our time together today. Oh, Jana, thank you for having having me. I'm so happy to be here. And tell us a bit about your husband, John. Who was he in the world? What was he like in your marriage? Um, You know, I met John when I was young. I was just in my last year of college. The, The thing that I remember most is that he was so smart and so funny. So he had this very, very serious side. Um, he, you know, he worked for a company doing computer work in sort of the early days of, of computing, you know, it was like the early 90s. And um, so he had this really serious side. And then on the other hand, he was just incredibly funny. And so it was sort of like, which John am I going to get? So it just <laughs> made the relationship amazing because he just had such a um, a, a big personality and a, and a wide variety of interests. And, and so um, that I just like still think about him in that way, that there was so much to him as a person. So he was in computers back when the computer was the entire room that someone might be standing in. Yes, we actually, um, we were working in the same company together and we had this thing called the intranet. So it was like the very first email and nobody (laughs) else in the company like knew how to do it. So it was the two of us. um, Yes. So the early days of computing, the early days of our relationship were pretty tied together. And then John was diagnosed with HIV two years before you got married back in 1989. And when he first got that diagnosis, he asked you to leave him. And I wonder what it was like to hear him say that. Obviously, you said no. But what did that conversation end up looking like? Um, I was surprised at first, you you know, and if if you think about it, like I was just a senior in college when this was going on. So, you know, just incredibly young at the time. And um, we were fairly new in our relationship, probably six or seven months into the relationship. So not very far into the relationship. And I was just like, no, this it, does, it makes absolutely no sense to me to leave a relationship because just because you have this diagnosis. Um, and in, in that, you know, as you hear me say that, and, you know, as I reflect on who I am today, cl- clearly I was intellectualizing 
the emotional response, right? I I could have had this wide range of emotional response, but I think the protective factor in me was to just go to this intellectual space, like that makes no sense. You know, and I think looking back, there there were other ways to respond, but that was my immediate response. And then later, you know, really coming to understand the emotional meaning, the HIV diagnosis at the time, like it was one thing to get the information and then just everything about our world changed, as you can imagine, just everything about our world changed. And that and it was just like this onslaught of so much. Um, but my immediate response was just this intellectual, no, that makes no sense to leave you at all. And just to ground us in some context, you know, 1989, when someone received an HIV diagnosis is very different than today in 2023. What was John's understanding of that and your understanding of it? Yeah, to contextualize, I mean, that was a time when HIV essentially had a two-year prognosis. So you'd get a diagnosis and nearly everyone was dead within two years. It was just understood that two years was what you had. Um, And again, like me coming to understand like that, that just made no sense to me, like, because he looked well, like that was one of the things is that um, he looked healthy, he seemed healthy. And when I talk about that onslaught, I mean, one of the things that happens when someone gets this, a a difficult um, diagnosis, and your listeners probably understand this, is suddenly your world becomes all about medicine in the medical field. And suddenly we're like this appointment and that appointment and what's his T cell count. And, you know, and it became very clear that he was very ill and had a lot of HIV um, symptoms, a lot of things that were going on inside his body that weren't necessarily external right away. And so we just hit this total onslaught slot of medical appointments, new medications, you know, AZT was the medication that was available then for folks that remember like back in the HIV days, like that one medication that was available, incredibly toxic. He got sick from the medication. But that was kind of the the, the HIV time or what was going on in that field at the time. So the understanding was this is a, a diagnosis that will end his life. Yeah, one of the things that the person who did our HIV test said to him that was really hard um, and probably kind of like started me to really understand what was coming at me was don't buy life insurance, which it was just, just like, I think that, you know, like the person didn't know what to say and I feel like I'm giving them a pass and maybe I shouldn't because I think that that's probably not the best message to deliver, but um, you know, how to deliver to a very young couple, you, you know, like a, I was what, 24, 25, how to deliver to a very young couple that um, we had a life sentence impending that was just a, a really tough time. And then here you are, you're in your early 20s, you're in this relationship, your partner, boyfriend at the time receives this diagnosis, you move forward with getting married, and wondering like, what was it like to be a young married person who's also in a pretty full time caregiving role? Um, it was incredibly difficult. And I think that I didn't really understand until later how difficult it was because we were just so much in this process of coping day by day. You know, I sh- we should have been at the time where we're building our careers. We should have been at the time where we're thinking about like our family and, and having a child, which we did. But um, really, instead of all of those things that a young couple is, is working with, we were actually working with like, who's our hospice provider? What hospice volunteers do we need? Um, you know, what, what is the, the tension between the medication making you so sick versus, you know, whether or not it'll extend your life and whether we should take it. Like all of those questions um, we were admired in day by day. Um, and so it, suddenly one of the things that happened was all of our friends sort of fell away. And the reason why I think is that their lives were about having babies, building their careers, you know, buying houses and ours were about dying. And so it's so incredibly difficult that we became so isolated in that sense. And in that process, you also, you know, you mentioned you decided to have a child together. And could you share a little bit about, it may not have been a thought process, it may have just been an emotional process to have a child. Yeah, I think that 
you know, if you think about like going into the concepts about grieving, I think that the, we had some bit of denial about what was going on in terms of HIV. And and I worked at Planned Parenthood at the time. So I clearly understood the mode of transition. I clearly understood condoms. I clearly understood the risk that I was at in terms of HIV. But um, denial is a powerful thing. And, and I, I know that we you know, it's it's a rough concept to talk about in, in, in when we talk about grieving because um, people can get really defensive. But I just want to say, like, I was probably looking back in a bit of denial that really what was going on, um, and, and and so that was part. I can't say that there was a ton of decision making behind having a child, but I do think that that was part of it. And I think that the, when I was pregnant, it was suddenly like, oh, I get this. Like I was sort of like kicked out of that phase or stage, I'm putting this in air quotes, people can't see me, <laughs> but like that phase or stage of grieving, it's like, nope, there's no more denial here. Like this is too much risk of my life, you know? And, and so that, that was a whole other kind of uh, piece of um, being newly married. That's what you want to do. You want to have a baby like we did. And, and um, but it was incredibly difficult in the context of him dying and, and having a, a really serious infectious disease. Mm. And Peg, I apologize. I did not mean that to be such an intrusive question. I was coming at it from the place of the idea of bringing a child into the world with so much responsibility. You already are a caregiver for your husband who is facing the end of his life. And now you're about to become a caregiver of a child who you're going to bring into this world. Uh, And the idea that I will most likely be a solo parent in this journey. Yeah, I mean, that was part of it. I don't feel like it's an intrusive question at all. I mean, and that's why I responded in the way I did. I I, do, I don't really see that as intrusive. Um, and, and that was part of the, the component of, um, you know, like quickly, my daughter's name was Hannah. And, and very quickly, we had to understand, like, what does her life as a one-year-old or a two-year-old with a dying father, what does that look like? Um, how do we, you know, and, and one of the decisions we made is like his hospital bed was in the living room, which is her play space. You know, and and we were really thoughtful about that and really decided that, you know, dying is real. It's going to be real in her life. So let's make it real. Let's not try to hide it. You know, those decisions were incredibly difficult. And this, these are not decisions that new parents typically make. I'm thinking about you now, back then, knowing that you are in the academic world. So you obviously value learning tremendously. And I'm thinking in this moment, as a young mother and a young wife to a husband who is dying, you're learning so much about grief. You're learning about grief from John's process of dying. You're learning about grief from your own process of grieving. And you're also learning about grief from watching your daughter, Han- your daughter Hannah, both before and after her father dies. And looking back, like what, what were you picking up about grief? Yeah, well, it's interesting. My mom also is a hospice nurse. So I did have that sort of um, backgrounds of, of death and dying being very common and part of everyday conversations. And I think that that was really beneficial to me, um, that that had been normalized in a way that my other peers didn't. So I feel like I had a little bit of support there that I understood grief and grieving and dying um, in, in a slightly different way, I think, than the general population. Um, but very much, um, again, I, I started this conversation conversation by talking about how I intellectualized it. And for me, you know, I think that um, I had to really teach myself that managing my grief through intellect really wasn't managing my grief. You know, I had to manage my grief through the emotional piece. And so I had a really good therapist um, that helped me through that. And then also thinking about how to manage my daughter's grief. Like what was the science back then of, you know, children and grieving? There wasn't a lot. And um, so really helping her and in, in, um, what is the role of a mother um, who is working with a child who's grieving, you know, who's supporting and loving a child is grieving is, is, was a big part of that, that process also. What were some of the things that you discovered about that role of like what Hannah needed from you? Um, I think how I approached it was that I decided I didn't necessarily wanted to be a specialist in um, grieving with children. And I knew I was going to be a social worker. I knew I was going to go into the field of HIV or death and dying. But I decided at the time, instead of becoming the 
um, an expert or knowledgeable about childhood and children's grieving, that rather the best thing that I could do for my daughter was be her mother in that space and find the appropriate professionals to help her through that process, that I was the only mother that she could have, we could find a host of therapists, you, you know, not necessarily, I, I actually have to walk that back a little bit. There weren't a host of people who knew a lot about childhood <laughs> grieving at the time. So there weren't a lot, but I really felt like my role was to be her mother. Um, and, and so that's how I approached it is to, you know, look to the experts to help us figure out the path forward. I want to start talking about your current role as the executive director for Death with Dignity. But before that, can I ask you one more Hannah question? Is that all right you with bet. you? You can okay. ask, I love talking about my daughter. You can okay. ask me all the Hannah questions in the world. Well, one thing I was thinking about is I started at Dougie Center in 2002. And at that time, there was a program in town in Portland. I cannot remember the name of it. But they worked specifically with kids who had parents and older siblings who had died of HIV. So they did peer grief support groups very similar to Dougie Center, but that was their that was their focus and it came from this recognition that many of those kids experienced so much stigma and shame about how their person died that coming together in that community was really helpful and I I wonder how you could you talk a little bit about how you and Hannah navigated that? You bet. So um, there was an organization out of Milwaukee at the time called um, uh, Camp Heartland, which was a camp for kids with HIV. And then we had one that was regionalized here in Portland um, because we moved to Portland in 2004, 2005. And so Hannah and then she has two older siblings, um, two stepbrothers. And they one of the things that they did is they went to this camp every year and it was a camp for kids with HIV or whose parents had HIV. And it really gave them this, um, well, community. Clearly, it was community that um, they could all come together and be kids, but also have this shared experience. Because if you think about like where we were living before we moved to Portland, we were in Iowa, very rural Iowa. There was nobody else that Hannah knew who had an experience like hers. And so it was really important, that idea that um, she knew other people or had some experience that normalized her experience. Um, and, and that was a big part of it was Camp Heartland and going to a support group in Portland and working and knowing other kids that either had HIV or had, who had parents who died. And yet I'll just say, like, I, I can see my daughter's social media. It's full of those friendships back from when she was six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10, that she built in camp. Um, she just has this lifetime of, of relationship with them because they have a shared horrible experience that the rest of us don't have. I, I think too about like kids now, current day kids who maybe their person has died of suicide or died of substance use or some other death that comes again with a lot of stigma and shame from other people. And so many of their parents and caregivers are worried for them when they go to school in terms of are they going to share how their person died? And some folks will even coach their kids not to because they're so worried about what the repercussions of that will be. Dougie Center obviously encourages people to like make decisions that make the most sense in their context and for kids to be able to be honest about their story when it feels good and right and safe for them. Uh, were those conversations that you and Hannah had when she was younger? Oh, yeah. And especially her older brothers, too. So they, you know, Hannah was was young. They were a little bit older when their dad died. And um, so for them, it was very relevant because they were actually in kindergarten. You know, they were in second grade. There was some pressure actually for them to not participate in like a soccer team because of the HIV stigma. And so I think her older brothers actually experienced it just a little bit more because they had come from a time when there wasn't HIV in their life, but Hannah was so young that there was never a time when it wasn't in her life. And so for her, it was very real. And because we normalized it in our family, she just talked about it openly and expected everybody to support her. And for the most part, like I was there. So if there wasn't support, like I could run that interference. <laughs> but I do think it's a little bit different just because, you know, she was like she was with that first generation of kids born to people who went on to die of HIV. But it was her whole life. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you and John worked hard at home too, 
to decrease any like shame or stigma around it, that it was a normalized experience that dad has this illness and it has this name HIV. Yeah, we d- I, we worked really hard about that. And it was interesting, you know, I just published a piece in um, about John's story. I just kind of like the the pandemic brought me back. So I published this piece and I was, I for some reason I was zooming through the comments. Don't ever read the comments, right? And there were still <laughs> these comments about how did he get HIV? And I'm like, this is like 30 years later. Are we still asking this question? You, you, you know, like we're still trying to stigmatize someone. And, and he's, I mean, you know, like the reality, he's been dead 30 years and we still have this question. It's so, it's so intrusive. And that, that stigma just, I mean, you know, like that HIV stigma needs to go away. It needs to be done. Yeah, it makes me think again of the kids in our groups who their person died of, well, they just say my person died. And the first question is always how, how? and then why? if they say they died of suicide, the next question is why? I do not have that answer for you right, right now. Um, right. Yeah. And, and especially question. because I'm 12 or 14. I mean, not only am I not an adult, you know, not only do I not know the answer, but I'm also like, it's probably not appropriate for me to have to like figure that out and tell you as an adult that answer. Although I have to say, sometimes the youngest kids say the most profound piece about their understanding of what their person was struggling with. And I'm like, oh, as an adult, if I could just like distill it down to that, I feel like that would be helpful not only for my own understanding, but for other people and how to support me too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. So the piece that you mentioned, Peg, that you wrote, uh, it's the title is my husband asked me to help him die, I couldn't do it. And my life changed forever. And that pretty clearly, you know, outlines kind of how you got into the work that you're doing now as the executive director for death with dignity. Could you share a little bit about kind of your way of getting into this work, but also a bit about the history of medical aid and dying? You bet. I think there were a couple of moments in John's life that were big. I mean, we started this conversation about one where he said, you know, leave me. And the other one, this one that you're referring to came much later in our relationship when it was very clear that he was dying. He was suffering tremendously. We had solid hospice care, like great health care. Um, but, you know, his uh, the symptoms were really bad, really, really bad. But also he wanted some amount of control. Like he knew he was dying. He didn't want to continue to suffer in this living room. Like that, that was his kid's playroom. And that's when he asked me to kill him to end his life. And I couldn't do it. And I had no answer. And that moment was so incredibly important to me because it was very clear that I didn't want other people to be in the same situation like this. Like I knew that I had a direction at that moment that I really wanted to help people not be in this situation. Um, So really we spent the rest of John's life putting together my graduate school applications for me to go to social work school. You know, I looked at medical school and then we talked about it. I, you know, that was really my number one choice. And it was very clear, like as a single parent, like, you know, taking care of Hannah, if I had to be in a 12 hour shift, or it was just not going to happen. And so, and social work is a much better fit anyway. And so we worked together to apply to social work schools. And that was kind of the last thing he did. And that's really how I got into this work. And then you bring up the concept of medical aid and dying. What's interesting is that this was going on. So he died in 93. What was going on at the time um, in the in the movement is that um, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act was being written in 93 and voters voted on the, the first time in 1994. So like my story rose at about the same time and it's pro- clearly coincidental. There probably is one little link And I would just say that the part of the link is that some of the early work on our movement that illustrating the importance of this issue came from the AIDS movement. So many young people were dying. They were dying badly. They didn't have agency. It was completely out of their control. And so, you know, that's part of the impetus to start the Death with Dignity movement is um, out of that HIV experience. There were other dying things that were going on. That, that brought the issue to the forefront in Oregon, but certainly the AIDS epidemic was one of them. Currently, is the, the terminology now death with dignity and also medical aid and dying? Are those the two terms that most accurately reflect? Yes. So um, medicine 
is starting to call the practice medical aid in dying. So for a long time, medicine and, and physicians didn't really have language of what they were going to call it. And, you know, our opponents would call it like physician assisted suicide and throw in that suicide word. You talked earlier about the, the stigma and everything associated with that word. And our opponents like to use it because it scares people and drives them away. And so medicine didn't have sort of a name for the process. And so medical aid in dying is the name for the medical process that happens. Um, and death with dignity is really what the general public thinks about or knows it as. And so it sounds like Oregon was one of the first states to start looking at having a death with dignity law put in place. And now in 2023, where does that stand in terms of which states it is legal in? So Oregon has the first of its kind in the United States, and it's actually the first of its kind in the world. So we we here in Oregon were very, very forward thinking and how we want to support people who are dying. That was back in 93. And then since then, uh, 10 other states have passed death with dignity, either through the ballot initiative, like we did in Oregon and in Washington, or through the legislative process, like has happened in California, Colorado, well, Colorado was ballot initiative, California, Hawaii, the District of Columbia, New Jersey, Maine, and New Mexico. I think I got everybody. That, that's, that's all of the states. And then there was a court decision in Montana that said that there's no way that a physician could be prosecuted in Montana based on their constitution if they prescribe to a terminally ill individual. So that those are the jurisdictions. And again, they came about by the ballot initiative, like in Oregon, and then through the legislative process or through the courts. Is there an example that you could share without you know, breaking confidentiality that could illustrate how death of dignity, medical aid and dying is making a difference in the lives of those who are dying? Yeah, I mean, I, I from my position, I'm, I'm so blessed that I get to hear people's dying stories. And, and I, I think of that as really just a great privilege because that's, you know, dying is a very intimate moment in someone's life. And so to, to be able to hear those stories is just a, a moment of privilege. But I, I actually can tell the story of a, a guy I was working with here in Portland. And I, I typically don't do patient work. Most of what I do is legislative work, working with lobbyists and legislators. But occasionally I got get called into really tough questions, really tough situations. And so there was a, a man who was, was dying and he was in a skilled nursing facility that wouldn't allow death with dignity. So he wanted, he needed to be moved somewhere else where he could take advantage of the law. And um, I was helping them find a place for him because he was very, very medically fragile. He was very, very ill. He was very, very sick. And I went to meet him and very clearly he was not gonna qualify. Like he, so in order to qualify, you have to be mentally competent to make and communicate healthcare decisions. That's, there are many standards. That's one of the standards. And I'm, I wasn't sure that he was there. It was very clear to me that he knew what he wanted, he wanted death with dignity, but he was really going in and out of, um, um, you know, whether or not there was some dementia going on, some things. So it was, so he wouldn't qualify. And what was also very clear to me in a very devastating cancer diagnosis, um, almost the entire bones in his pelvic cradle were gone because of bone cancer. So incredibly amount of pain. And what I realized is that his pain was not controlled in the facility. I mean, it, he, it felt like a medical emergency to me and they were not treating the pain in my opinion. And I, and they didn't want me there because they didn't believe in death with dignity. I think they were relig religiously affiliated and I had big words with them. And, you know, they wanted to talk to me about this guy's death with dignity request and all the reasons why. And I wanted to talk to them about his pain. Like this was like, he was asking for death with dignity because of pain, which could have been controlled. I was so mad. And it, interestingly, what happened is that um, I continued to see him, even though he didn't, you know, continue with the process, but very clearly they they did a better prescription for his pain medication. They, they had his pain well controlled. And I continued to visit him until he died because um, his, fan, his wife had died earlier. So he was here alone. The reason why I tell that story is some people think about death with dignity as only the people who ingest the medication. 
Um, but the, it, the, it's about a whole bunch of other people. Um, it's about peace of mind. It's about control at the end of life. It's about how we communicate symptoms, how our doctors listen to us or don't listen to us when we're dying. Um, and so death with dignity is just not, you know, the act of getting a medication or medical aid and dying, ingesting it to control the timing and manner of your death. It's about a whole bunch of other issues related to dying. And then for those times when someone does go in the route of getting the medication, choosing to end their life. Is that the right way to say that? That seems not quite right. I'm going to edit this out. So we don't have good language for it. I'm not sure you need to edit it out. I mean, the reality is because we just we just have a death taboo. You know this. Your listeners know this. Sometimes when we're in this conversation, we're fumbling around with language because we don't have good models, because we don't do it great in society. But essentially, someone is controlling the timing and manner of their death. Thank you. And that is the language I was looking for. I'm thinking about the friends and the family of someone who is dying and they choose the control, the control, the manner, the day, the time of their death. Have you had much interaction with the family and friends who are kind of left befi- left behind and how that opportunity or the death of dignity opportunity impacts them? Um, I have, I, I have a great deal ex- of experience with that. And um, one of the interesting things that happens with death with dignity overwhelmingly is people use the opportunity to have what we might call a living wake. They they use, they're dying, they know that it's going to be Tuesday or Friday or or, or whatever, whatever day that they pick. And so very frequently, it just almost to a person, people are able to bring their family members together and have this sort of saying goodbye experience while the person is still alive and alert and awake and competent. Those are so rich. I've been invited to a few of those. They're just incredibly rich and they can range from you, you know, so incredibly solemn, religiously focused, spiritually focused exercises or drunken brawls. And I and I say that with the most love, because I think that, you know, I think people die how they live. Typically, if, if someone is dying from an extended illness, you know, their behaviors and their life is much the same, even though death is involved. And so, you know, you really get to know the family. And so in that family members, I believe, get a little step forward, heads up into the grieving process, right? Because they they get to have this opportunity to do some grieving or talk about it when the person is still alive. Um, and so people tend to, I can't say that every family member supports the decision that, that their family member makes, but for the most part, and overwhelmingly I hear this decision makes sense. This 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 is my this is the way my mom wanted it. This is you know I'm not surprised that I don't agree with this decision. I'm not surprised that she made this decision. Like like when the the family members are in some amount of conflict, that tends to be the conflict. Like I don't agree with it, but this makes sense to me, or I understand, or that it's patient controlled. Like my mom made this decision, and so, and so I think that all of those things. Um, can act as ways to, I, and the language is, is odd here, but sort of smooth the grieving grieving process in the beginning. Um, it doesn't happen like that all the time. Um, clearly people struggle. Grief is different for everyone. Um, but, I, but I do think that there are opportunities for family members to say goodbye, for family members to understand, um, you know, to make amends um, and to celebrate their loved one when they're still here. Do you have a sense, Peg, of how working in this world to expand access to death of dignity, medical aid of dying, how has it, I mean, it's visibly impacted you with the stories that you tell and, you know, just what it has meant for you to be part of this work, but has it shifted your experience of grief? I think it has. I'm much more comfortable in a grief space Um, I'm much more comfortable identifying it when I see it. I'm much more comfortable identifying, you know, if something happens in life, not, not, not like somebody died, but, but something happens and I'm like, Oh, that is grief. 
<laughs> you know, and it's not just related to, to somebody dying. And so I, I feel like I'm much more comfortable in it. And I think I, I can tell a little story about that, like writing the article that you pulled up that I was talking about earlier. Um, there was a moment where it was, it suddenly like, hit me again, you know, and, and I was talking to Hannah because I wanted to get her consent to run the story because it's, and, and it's her pictures too, right? So I wanted to get that. And it hit both of us again. And, um, you know, there was a part of me that was like, oh, I'm just going to go to work. And then I, I took a moment and I was like, no, I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to deal with this grief right now, because I know if I don't, if I try to kick it down the road, like it's just going to come back. So I'm, I'm just going to deal with it right now. And, you know, the only way out is through, so to speak. And so I, I just took him. I'm like, this is a grieving day for me. And I, yeah, I, I couldn't have done that 20 years ago. Like, I, I, I couldn't have had that perspective. And um, I, I'm so appreciative that I have that perspective now. Well, Peg, as we come to the end of our time together, is there anything else that you want to leave our listeners with? Um. I think that your listeners are probably pretty sophisticated about death and dying. And typically I'm talking to an audience that doesn't really think about death and dying. And um, what I always like to say is, you know, I think that people um, fear talking about death and dying because they think, oh, it might make it happen, um, you know, or all of the, the stigma or fear that we have, fear of the unknown, the death taboo. But really when I think when we're talking about death and dying, we're talking about living. We're not talking about the end when we're not here. We're really talking about how we want to live now, how we want our family to live and how important that is. Um, it's conversations about love. You know, I, I applaud your listeners for having some understanding of death and dying because I think it's really about how we live our lives. Yeah, and I imagine some of our listeners are like, I never wanted this understanding, but now that I have it, I can't not know what I know now. Uh, and recognizing how it, how important and helpful it is to be able to talk not only before someone dies about things like love and life, but how do we continue to talk about the people that we care about after they have died and continue to have their lives be uh, recognized and honored and memorialized, which uh, really stood out to me in the article that you wrote of honoring John's life. So I appreciate your time today, Peg, and thank you for being part of Grief Out Loud. Thank you, Jana. I'm so pleased. This was a great conversation. And listeners out there, I know you're tired of me saying this, but I say thank you each and every time for tuning in, for being part of our show, being part of the community, sharing episodes with people that you think might be helped in some way by what we're talking about. If you want to reach me directly, you can email me at griefoutloud at dougie.org. And that's D-O-U-G-Y dot O-R-G is also the main website for Dougie Center, uh, which is the producer of Grief Out Loud. And at our website, you can find all of our free downloadable resources, things like tip sheets, activity sheets, and of course, every episode of Grief Out Loud. We are grateful as always for being sponsored in part by the Chester Stephan Endowment Fund. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us again next time.